Okay, um, hello, uh, this is Dennis Nasuda. I'm the uh, engineering manager for simulation and optimized thermal systems. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, so I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, anyone who comes in late um, can probably catch up to speed. Um, a few items before we start. Um, I'm going to ask that you all mute your microphones while I go through these slides and uh, demonstration, and then just unmute yourself if you have questions so there's not too much background noise. Um, and then the other item is that this session will be recorded. Um, so if you have a problem with that, um, in terms of speaking up and having your, your voice on the recording, uh, you can send me a, a question or comment in chat as well. Um, so is everyone able to hear me all right? And, and we can we can go ahead and get started. Yes, yeah, sounds good. All right, great. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and mute everyone's microphone. And when you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask me, or or send it by chat. Um, Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is the first uh, webinar that we've we've hosted at, at OTS on uh, Quill Designer and VapePsych, and hopefully there'll be um, you know many more. We'll continue to do this as, as we get feedback from from our customers on uh, what's helpful um, and, and what kind of information we can provide. Uh, but the the topic here is really just to go over some of the um, new updates to Coil Designer and VapePsych that just were released uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, there aren't, aren't too many major changes, but there are some, some new features and enhancements that uh, may be useful to you, and, and um, I want to make sure those are, those are clear and highlighted. Um, so the schedule today, I'll just go through what all of those um, updates are, um, some bug fixes, enhancements, and new features. I'll do a, a short demo with Coil Designer and VapePsych to show some of the new features. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions and discussion. You can give me your comments on, on the new, new features, questions about how to use uh, different items in the tools. And we can also talk about um, any topics you'd like to see in the future for, for webinars that we could host, um, or you know, new features you'd like to see in Coil Designer and some other miscellaneous items. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so optimized thermal systems, I want to put a little bit of background information in here because I know that um, some people attending are, are optimized thermal systems customers using Coil Designer. Some people are, um, you know, CEEE members or, or uh, partners with the university, um, and this is obviously open to the public. Um, hopefully, in the future, you know, anybody who's interested can can join these kind of sessions. Um, but the point here is that optimized thermal systems is is distributing the software Coil Designer and VapePsych. It's being developed at CEEE. Um, so these updates that you see here are coming out of a lot of research that's that's being done at the University of Maryland, as well as some, some work from OTS, um, where we will um, you know, add some features and uh, correlations and so on to the software. So um, that's kind of where, where all of this is coming from. So a couple of weeks ago, you probably noticed that um, your Coil Designer and VapePsych versions expired, stopped working kind of suddenly, um, and we sent out these new releases. Um, these are the uh, update, these are the version numbers of, of Coil Designer and VapePsych, the newest versions. And these are what I'm going to be showing today. Um, so with Coil Designer, um, just note that this changed a second time. You got an initial email saying there was an update. Um, and then we sent a follow-up email that had another update. The only difference between the two was an update to the um, reporting in the, the new PDF output. Um, there are just some, some unit issues, and we fixed that, that, that problem. Um, so, you know, if, if you have the chance, if you haven't already updated, um, make sure you get the latest version. So, uh, going through, starting with Coil Designer, let's talk about the, um, the new features that are added in. Um, and I'm going to do a demo to show these in a little more detail. Um, well, the one main f new feature is export as PDF. In the past, you were able to export your results as a spreadsheet. Um, now there are three different options for PDFs. Uh, basic up to detailed output sheet that's going to describe the coil that was created and the results that, that come out. Um, it's, you know, it might be helpful for distributing to customers or, or something like that um, and having a, a more formal documentation of your coil. And then the other two new features are these two new correlations. Um, these are CFD-based correlations for two to five millimeter tubes. Um, and they, they're for bare tubes without fins and also for tubes with plane or plate fins. And I'll talk a little bit about those in the next slide. 
There are also a couple of bug fixes you may or may not have noticed um, in your use of the software. Um, the first one was uh, with loading airside information into Coil Designer. Uh, if you're a non-US customer and you use uh, commas rather than uh, you know, uh, periods to denote a decimal, um, there was some issue with loading in that information that's corrected now. Um, there was an error discovered in the uh, Gronerud correlation, and that was updated. Um, and then there are some, as I mentioned, these minor updates to the PDF export uh, that have to do with the units that are being displayed. So that's that's all now corrected. Um, so regarding these these correlations, um, these are two new correlations, and I want to give a little bit of background on how they were developed and how this is going to um, affect use of the tool in the future. Um, and for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, I'm going to give a little bit of information. So um, these correlations are done by a PhD student at, at the University of Maryland, uh, Daniel Bessler, and um, you know our other colleagues at the university and, and OTS. Um, this uh, the the concept here behind these these correlations is that uh, the geometry of the heat exchanger is being built uh, par you know, parametrically um, in a CFD environment and then simulated. So uh, basically, the author was able to simulate or build and simulate heat exchangers having all of these ranges of dimensions um, in a CFD tool, get those simulation results, and then reduce that into a correlation that can be used by Coil Designer. And you can read more about this on this paper. It's publicly available. It's from last year's Purdue conference. Um, but basically, this gives us the ability to um, simulate any of these bare tube or um, plain finned tube heat exchangers from 2 to 5 millimeter outer diameter. Um, having these um, you know, fins per inch range and um, tube pitch and velocities um, within Coil Designer without having to do the experimental work um, and uh, and get very good fit. So the data is well predicted here, and this is this is a measure of um, how well the correlation predicts the data from CFD. This does not come with any kind of experimental validation, at least at this point. That hasn't been that hasn't been published yet. Um, so. You know, using these correlations is sort of done at your own risk, um, understanding the methodology behind um, the, the CFD-based correlation. Um, and in the future, there will be some experimental validation work that, to go along with this to show that the CFD approach is actually able to predict the real-world real performance of uh, the bare tubes and plain tube heat exchangers. And I'll show a little bit of an example of that in, in, uh, uh, in a in the demonstration so you can see how those correlations work. So um, in addition to the main new features and the bug fixes, there are just some enhancements to the existing features. Um, and I'm just going to go down the list. Um, and uh, again, if, if you have questions in, in the middle of this, it's probably better to just speak up and ask me now. Um, so if, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt whenever, whenever you need. Um, and, and we can uh, discuss in a little more detail. So uh, the first enhancement has to do with the parallel parametric analysis. This is really just kind of um, a man memory management fix that allows us to um, kind of do a, do a better job with the parallel runs. Um, you can have a larger number of runs. You can export the, uh, the data to Excel faster. Um, so if you're doing a, a large parametric analysis, you may have noticed in the past there are some bottlenecks, and um, it, it may be slow to do certain tasks. Uh, this should improve the experience with the parallel uh, parametric analysis tool. <clears throat> and then um, another feature that's added in here I'm showing below is comments uh, within the user interface. So um, I'm already finding this to be pretty helpful. Um, as you're building a coil, if you know, say you make a change to that and you have two versions, you can leave some comments explaining what are the differences between version 1 and version 2. Uh, you can state the time and date. Um, or any, any other details you want to include in there. Um, and this is all within the edit parameters interface. Um, you can see that all along. And then when you save that, that'll obviously be, be saved to that, um, to that interface, as well as if you export to a PDF, um, those comments will be available there as well. So just another feature to help keep track of uh, different, different heat exchangers. Um, the Lockhart-Martinelli correlation, you'll now see that there are two different correlations for that, um, for that, that one. Um, and and the, the change comes from uh, kind of giving you the choice of using the Martinelli parameter um, or, or calculating uh, chi from the actual um, flow regime. So two different approaches to doing that um, are, are given to you. Um, 
And uh, in the edit airside data, um, we now have the ability to explicitly paste your information from Excel into the um, into the space, which um, is something a, a number of people had requested in the past. Uh, previously, you had to load and save a file, a CSV file, to load in your array of temperatures and velocities and humidities. Um, now you can just paste that data directly in place, um, and that, that may save a little bit of time. Um, so I, I'm not sure if anyone has uh, um, has been aware of this process, uh, but so the interface to, to Coil Designer, as you may have noticed, if you're using a large uh, large monitor with a high resolution, can sometimes be a little bit um, unusual. You'll get um, cramped text or, or displays that don't 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 look right. Um, this is kind of a relic from. Um, when the tool was developed, that kind of high resolution support wasn't available. Um, screens just um, screens weren't being made like that. And um, to develop the interface, um, it, it wasn't possible to develop the interface to be totally um, independent of, of the, the resolution. So that, that obviously has all changed in, in the last few years. And um, in order to update the user interface, it's actually a, a relatively time consuming process. So CEEE is taking a, an incremental approach to updating the interface, sort of one screen at a time. Um, in the past updates, we've, we've updated various screens. In this release, this uh, refrigerant inlet state screen, uh, air and refrigerant inlet state screen is getting updated. Um, and uh, as, as we continue move forward, that's, um, that'll, those, all those screens will continue to get updated um, until you know, display is hopefully uh, looking good on, on everyone's monitor. And if you have questions about that, you know, you can feel free to email me uh, tech, tech support questions. Um, there are plenty of workarounds to get the, the interface to look good on your screen. Um, so hopefully nobody's having any problems you know, viewing the, the text and, and values. Um, and then number six, um, we've added support to 2016 Office. So if you ex export to Excel and you have the future version of Office of Excel, um, that should be supported and compatible, and there'll be no problems there. Um, as you may have experienced with, uh, you know, our, our property routines, some of them are fast, some of them, so, so that those fast properties are, are um, sort of a speeded up version um, that's that's developed at the university. The slower fluids, the less common fluids, are, are more or less directly being computed from RefProp. Um, so. It's desirable to have these these faster uh, refrigerant property routines. If you use something like 410A, 134A, you'll see that you get much faster results than a more um, obscure fluid um, that isn't in the uh, the fast library. So we've added a couple more fluids um, to allow for fast calculations. Um, these three listed here, um, and then for anyone using the tube in tube uh, solver, um, there are some some enhancements made for the stability of that, that solver, um, particularly for the uh, fluted tube heat exchangers. Um, so there are three more enhancements um, for spine fins. If, if anyone uses spine fins for their heat exchangers, uh, the calculation of fin efficiency um, wasn't previously in there. We had fin efficiency for flat plate fins and other types of fins as, as options in, within the correlations. Um, we've added this this spine fin uh, efficiency calculation from SHA, uh, which which you can select if needed. Um, number ten is uh, microchannels, and this is um, it's a big uh, improvement for microchannel support. If you have multiple banks of microchannels, there was a limit in the past. Now you can have up to twenty five slabs in the airflow direction. Below, I'm showing you know, lots of different slabs here, and you could kind of slide a, slide across and have as many. Um, up to 25 uh, slabs all, all in uh, in series. And then um, for the data reduction tool, um, the kind of capabilities of this have been expanded. Um, you can now have up to 100 data points per test coil as you as you use that tool to, to fit data. Um, so similar to the parametric study, we're just adding on um, capabilities to, uh, to be a little bit more robust, a little more uh, advanced. Okay, so, so that's it for uh, Coil Designer, um, and I'll, I'll show a little bit more of those capabilities in a, a demonstration in a few, a few moments. 
for VapePsych, um, the, the main new feature um, that, that wasn't there before is the calculation of SEER. So uh, previously, you would run VapePsych for a single point um, and, and get your COP or EER, and then uh, that result would be displayed. Um, in the new version, you can calculate SEER, and um, to do that, you have to specify the cyclic degradation coefficient. Um, I think if you don't know that value, this the standard from the uh, from 210, 240, if, if that value isn't listed, is 0.25. Um, for uh, the location, we have a, a list of cities that you can select, and you can also choose to run in parallel um, on, on multiple cores uh, to, to speed that process up. But essentially what's happening is um, when you click run, instead of running that single point simulation that you'd specified, it's going to run uh, several points uh, related to the, the temperatures and relative humidities uh, corresponding to the, the 210-240 standard. Um, and then it will, it will do the calculation to, um, to weight those different EERs at those different conditions and, and give you this SEER for your location. Um, some other enhancements, um, the generic tube model or the pipe model um, now has a different way to specify pressure drop. Previously, you could ignore the pressure drop. You could use a fixed value or you could use uh, some correlations. Now you can um, you know, specify it as in terms of these loss coefficients, um, CV, just like you would in an uh, you know, expansion device or other, other uh, pipe model. Um, Another big one that I think will be useful uh, if you do a lot of study of, um, of, uh, of cycles within VapePsych is the parallel processing capability for uh, the parametric study. So in the past, you could only run on a single core. You might have a, a large cycle, and um, you need to simulate lots of different operating conditions or configurations of, of the design. Um, in the past, having to run that on one core could probably be time consuming if you had a lot of runs to do. Now, if you have a workstation with lots of cores, um, you could simultaneously run as many cores as, as, you, uh, as you can support. Um, so this, this should help cut down time if, if you want to do a lot of parametric study of a cycle within VapePsych. This capability has always been in, or has been in Coil Designer for some time now, uh, but hadn't made it over to VapePsych. So now that feature is available. Um, and then um, this is kind of number three is a little bit more targeted towards uh, third-party developers. and people who are, are developing custom software using the tool. Um, this is, uh, there's a property calculations uh, update to the component tester. So if you're doing any development work, developing your own, uh, your own modules to go into VapePsych, this pertains to you. Otherwise, um, this, this may not be noticeable. Um, and then there are also a number of bugs fixes that were reported. Um, for VapePsych, uh, these are issues that users had, had, had found and, and we had fixed. Um, uh, so there were some solver post-processing results that, that had, there was some issue with um, when you have evaporators and expansion devices in parallel that, that has been, that was reported and, and has been fixed. Um, you can, uh, the, the saving and loading of coil designer files from the, uh, from the interface is, is corrected as well as the user interface uh, for uh, you know, the coil designer user interface when you edit parameters. Um, there were some issues there that had been fixed. Um, when running a parametric analysis and inputting information in terms of arbitrary points, like as if you were going to paste your, your points in from Excel rather than, than using the, um, the parametric analysis interface, um, there were some issues there with importing those, and that's been fixed. And um, uh, there's a, you know, backward compatibility for loading in your old VapePsych files. Um, which hopefully no one's had any problems with in terms of uh, updating to the new version, should have no, no issues in, in using your old files. So these are you know, relatively minor bug fixes that if you experienced, you're aware of, and um, can, can rest assured that they're corrected. Uh, otherwise, you may not have noticed them. They're, they're not, um, they haven't been uh, you know, at the forefront of uh, most people's experience. Okay, so looking into the future, um, we have some, some new features planned. Um, in general, we're, we're looking to in, increase our support for small diameter tubes, so that's five millimeters and below um, on the air side and the refrigerant side. Um, we've added a number of new correlations for the refrigerant side inside of small diameter microfin tubes for evaporation and condensation and single phase heat transfer and pressure drop. And um, 
at OTS, we're working to develop um, two new correlations for airside heat transfer and pressure drop of slit fins and louvered fins with three to five millimeter diameters. So this is very similar to the, um, the CFD-based correlations, the two that were just added. Uh, but this capability will be added in um, one of the next two releases, depending on how that, that project finishes. Um, and that will allow, um, allow you to, to simulate slit fins and louvered fins with these small diameter tubes. Um, previously, that hadn't been really readily available. There hadn't been any correlations that really comprehensively cover that whole range of, um, of different geometries and, and fin patterns. Um, now, now that can be simulated relatively, uh, relatively easily once those correlations go in. Um, the 3D view, um, if, if you've had any experience with it for the tube fin or microchannel uh, results, when you, when you look at the 3D view, uh, you see a temperature, the color uh, it corresponds to the temperature across the, uh, across the coil. Um, those 3D views are being improved to look a little bit better, um, and uh, they'll have support to also display other parameters. So um, you could look at you know, different values like pressure drop or quality across the coil face or across the tubes of the heat exchanger. Um, and then uh, we're also aiming to uh, increase our support for low GWP fluids. Um, so that would, um, this is specifically pertaining to the fluids that are tested in the AREP program. Um, so AREP phase two alternative refrigerants um, will be um, available in, in January this year or next year. Um, and following the kind of the public release of that information, uh, we'll be working to include the um, the support for those um, those alternative fluids, low, G, low GWP fluids, into Coil Designer, um, and then for Vape Psych, um, in terms of uh, new features, um, we're looking to have the capability to import compressor data from a spreadsheet. Uh, currently, you know, the only option is to use Access uh, to import uh, import your compressor data. Um, not everyone uses Microsoft Access, so the goal here is to have clean easy to use support to uh, import your compressor from a spreadsheet. Okay, so um, at this point I'm going to do a quick demonstration of a couple of the new features that I've talked about. Um, and again, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to jump in at any point. Okay. So I'm going to start with a, a VapeSec uh, sample cycle that comes with the program in, in the samples folder. Um, this is a simple 410A cycle, and it has two heat exchangers inside of it that um, come from coil designer files. So I'm going to open up this, this outdoor heat exchanger and have a look at it. So this is the outdoor condenser. Um, it has nine tubes and, and one circuit, and it uses uh, relatively large diameter tubes. So uh, my goal here is to kind of show a uh, very quick, um, you know, not perfect, not optimized study, but uh, a quick study of uh, how we can reduce the tube diameters uh, in, in this coil. So um, here's the performance of the baseline coil. I'm going to open up a copy of that same coil. Let me go ahead and run that. And we can confirm this is, yes, the same, same heat exchanger we're starting with. So I'm going to go into Edit Parameters. And you have a look at what this coil exists, is composed of. So um, the tube diameter is, is 9 millimeters. Uh, it's spaced about a, an inch of uh, tube pitch. We have these nine tubes. So uh, what I really want to do here is uh, investigate uh, what happens if we were to go to five millimeter tubes? So I'm going to select a five millimeter tube. Um, this is a more or less a common tube thickness. Um, and I'm going to select a, a tube pattern or fin pattern, the, the tube pitches, that, that would be appropriate for five millimeters. And uh, just as an example, let's say that it's a 19 millimeter by 11 um, tube pattern on these five millimeter tubes, just for the the purpose of this example. And um, because the vertical spacing is smaller, I, I can fit more tubes in that in the vertical direction. So I'm going to go to 12 tubes. That should be about right. 
and uh, I'm going to add an extra uh, extra bank of, of tubes in the airflow direction. You go to staggered configuration as opposed to inline. And here you can see the comments screen, and I'm going to just denote here that this is my, my new uh, modified file. If I had any other comments to leave, I could leave the date and the time or um, specifics of what I was trying to accomplish with this model. So I'm going to go to um, using plate fins, so flat plate fins, um, so that I can use the correlation that I, I described, uh, the new CFD-based correlation. I'm going to leave the fin spacing and thickness. Everything should be the same there. And uh, to use that, five millimeter uh, correlation. I'm just going to go ahead and select uh, my heat transfer and pressure drop correlations from, uh, from the drop down. So previously we had, had been using this plate wavy fin from Commune and Webb. Um, now at the bottom we have these two new correlations that I, that I described previously. One for bare tubes, which has no fins, uh, for two to five millimeter outer diameter, and the other for plain fins. So that's what we're going to use here. And I don't need a correction factor on that, so I'm going to set that value to 1. And I'm going to do the same thing for pressure drop correlation on the air side. So this is the plain fin CFD-based correlation. So we have reasonable confidence in the fact that this correlation should predict our 5 millimeter outer diameter plate fin heat exchanger pretty well, because we have a whole lot of CFD data to back that up. Um, beyond that, I've, I've made the, these are the revisions I want to make to the, uh, the tube configuration and fin configuration, so I'm going to say OK. And of course I need to recircuit the coil now that I've uh, changed the number of tubes. So um, just as a rough thought, uh, I've changed the diameter of the tubes by about a factor of two, so the um, area and the mass flux is going to need to change by a factor of four. Um, so I had one circuit before. Let's do four circuits this time. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm going a little bit fast here. Um, going a project and generating circuits. Um, and I'm just going to generate four simple counterflow circuits. All right, so now I have my, my four circuits uh, built into the, the new five millimeter heat exchanger. And um, after I've done that, I, I need to remember to change my uh, refrigerant inlet conditions. So I'm going to go ahead and just pull up my old version of the coil on the right side and the new version on the left side. And then we can uh, just make sure we copy over all of the correct refrigerant inlet conditions into the interface. So uh, I want to get the right pressure and the temperature and the flow rate. So at this point, I think I have everything I need into this, this new heat exchanger. It's going to be running in the same operating conditions. And really, the only thing I've changed here is I've gone to the smaller diameter tubes and the plate fins. So I'll go ahead and run that. All right, so here are our results. Um, get that pretty quickly. Um, so let's go through this and have a look at, at what changed. Um, as far as the heat load, we have uh, a little bit of an increase in heat load. Um, but that's obviously not the final say in, in whether or not this is a good result. We want to make sure everything is, is kind of on, on equal footing. Um, so our, our heat load is, is a little bit better. That's a good sign. Our refrigerant charge is, is reduced slightly. Um, and, and perhaps if we used less tubes, we could, we could reduce that even more. Um, one very important change here is that the airside pressure drop looks like it's, it's reduced significantly. Um, so this could tell us that we could save on fan power, we could maybe use a smaller fan, um, or we could uh, use the same fan and maybe downsize the heat exchanger because we will be able to get more flow rate with a significant reduction in, in pressure drop. So another good sign for, for this design. Our refrigerant pressure drop is, is more or less the same um, as, as we had before, um, and that, that makes sense because we, have, we should have about the same mass flux going through the tubes. Uh, as far as outlet conditions, uh, this is another point we want to make sure is is uh, making sense. Um, we have the same capacity, but we want to make sure we're comparing uh, similar subcooling. With our baseline coil, we had about 5.5 Kelvin of subcooling. This is a condenser again, and um, our our new coil has 
8.7 degrees of subcooling. So that's that's a good sign. It, it tells us that we we're, we've oversized the coil. Um, it could handle even more flow rate, or it could be reduced in size if, if we wanted to, uh, to get the same performance as our baseline. And then uh, we'll come down and look at just the general size of the heat exchanger. Um, we haven't changed the tube length. We've reduced the depth of, of the coil. Um, even though we have two rows, they're, they're spaced together fairly closely, um, and the overall depth is, is actually less than we had with our 9 millimeter coil. And the height is reduced, too, um, in, in going to uh, the 19 millimeter spacing in the vertical direction. So we have a smaller coil, um, but what's probably more important is we have a lighter coil um, using less material. So with our original heat exchanger, we had 2.8 kilograms, 2.9 kilograms of fin material. With our new one, 2.5. And that's really, we have the same number of fins because we didn't change the length or the, the, um, the fin spacing, um, but the, the footprint of the coil is smaller. It has a, a smaller depth and height. So we saved a little bit on fin mass, but really the big change here is our tube material has been reduced by more than half um, in going from the 9 millimeters to the 5 millimeter tubes. And you know, by our very simple cost calculation, which could obviously be um, you know, improved by your own uh, costing functions, we've, we've reduced the cost from $30 of material down to about $18. Um, so I mean, this is by no means a, you know, a perfect comparison. This isn't an optimized design. Uh, just a very quick example to show that we can we can build a five millimeter coil now with the coil designer and have um, good confidence in the airside correlations uh, because in the past the airside correlations weren't so detailed. It's not an endorsement of of the small diameter design um, or or saying that this is an optimized configuration, but just a, a quick example to show you the capability is there and and you can explore these kind of designs on your own now. So uh, after I have these results, uh, I also wanted to show this new output feature. So before you used to have under results, just export results to spreadsheet as an option. Now you have export results as, as PDF. Um, and you have three levels of detail, just a simple summary, or you can have these detailed results. Um, that would be up to the level of uh, results that you get in the spreadsheet. So all of the segment level details of, of what's happening in the heat exchanger, um, or just the simple summary results. So if I create this summary PDF, um, I can get my, my coil designer results. I get the name of the, the heat exchanger and some information about the, the geometry. Um, and uh, you can see the unit system that I chose in coil designer. Um, so I'd, I'd been using millimeters instead of meters for, um, for uh, units of length. Those have, have come through. But all the units are, are the same as the units that I set in Coil Designer. So if you want this spreadsheet, or this this display sheet to look differently, you just have to change your unit settings in Coil Designer. That'll be converted and come through in here. Um, and this is a, just a one-page sheet, pretty simple, uh, to give you all the inlet and outlet conditions and a little bit of information about the geometry of the heat exchanger. Enough that maybe you could share with with a customer or um, send out to to manufacturing um, with with your, um, your information and your expected performance here for, for the design. So much much uh, better looking, and maybe a little bit easier to get through than the uh, spreadsheet result that was there before. Danny? Yes. Uh, uh, this is Shabu from uh, heat, heat Craft Refrigeration. Uh, for the uh, unit uh, we used here, if you change to the uh, uh, British unit, mm -hmm. and show the uh, PDF file. Sure. So if you go down to the uh, refrigerant side, uh, go down to the, the lower part of the file uh, page. Mm -hmm. Division side, temperature. Okay, so it's 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 right here, but it shows different numbers on on my. So um, and and this may have to do with uh, the second update that we released uh, because yes, we we had some issues with this. Um, the the conversion was the numbers weren't being converted properly for some of the outputs in the PDF output. So I would recommend just. Uh, Check that you have the same version. It should be 1019 at the end here. Um, if it's a different version, there was one that came out like a, a few days or a week before that. 
um, that version may have some issues with the output in the PDF. But in any case, if, if you do have the same version, you have an issue, I definitely want to hear about that. So um, you can just send me the files, and um, I can try to repeat it. And uh, if there's a bug, we can you know, work to quick, quickly fix that. Um, but yeah, I, I would do that. I, I think I, I, I downloaded and installed the uh, corrected version, you know, the, uh, the, the after you fix those problems, and still see one place. Uh, but I will do that later. OK. Great. Thanks. Um, so a couple other things to, to show here. Um, really quickly, I want to show a parametric analysis with this coil, um, because there's a feature here that uh, not all of our users are, are, um, are using. Um, so uh, you know, in general, when we use parametric analysis, we, we use these uh, geometry changes. Um, we might look at what happens when we change the tube length or the tube spacing of the coil. Um, but it's, uh, not everyone is, is using these um, refrigerant and air side uh, changes in the, uh, in the parametric study. I just want to show that that capability exists um, and, and that we can, uh, we can do that here as well. Um, Right, I'm just going to change back to SI units for my for my own sake. Um, okay, so um, so instead of changing the geometry of the heat exchanger, I'm going to change the operating conditions. Um, so on the air side, I want to look at what happens when uh, the ambient temperature changes from 300 to uh, let's say 317 Kelvin. And uh, this is a condenser, so it's you know we want to see what happens when it gets hotter outside. Um, but then I also want to look at the refrigerant state, and there's a couple a uh, couple different configurations. Just like when you set the inlet condition in uh, in the regular interface, you can choose single phase pressure and temperature, or you can specify pressure and quality. In any of these states, um, in this case, it's a condenser. I'm going to stick with pressure and temperature, and then I can change my my stream inlet state. So one of the issues here is. Um, you need to fully specify the state. So if I were to just say uh, in tube temperature and change that value, the results wouldn't come through in, in the table. We would, we would get the same result for all of them. Um, we need to fully define the state in the table in order uh, for it to apply that change. So um, by, by specifying the pressure and the temperature, I'm going to get this pairing of pressure and temperature, and then, then the simulation will run using that value. And it will run all the way up to these maximum values that I set. So let's just say up to three megapascals and um, 380 Kelvin. Um, so this is um, you know, a useful way to, to look at how your heat exchanger is going to change performance um, in the context of just the heat exchanger without having to go into VapeSyc. Um, but to see when you have different operating conditions on both the air and the refrigerant side, how does that impact the performance? Um, so just for the sake of saving time, I'm going to use the combination of, of, these, uh, of these three variables. I'll, I'll update my table just so I only have five runs. Um, I can run this in parallel if I want to, um, but there's no need at this point, and I can get my results. So here we're actually able to see how does the coil change in performance when we change the inlet refrigerant state and the air temperature. Um, so this is just kind of a reminder that this feature is here. Um, and uh, to use it properly, you need to fully define the refrigerant state at the inlet. Um, can't just set one of the, the properties. You need to set the full full state two properties. Um, okay, so uh, coming back to vape psych, um, we ran this this cycle before, and we got this this result. We can see our our EER. Um, uh, what I want to do is show the, the SEER calculation. Um, so there's a couple ways, as you know, to, to set up a vape psych, uh, cycle to get it to converge. Um, most commonly, I think we use subcooling and superheat as our criteria to get the cycle to converge. But when we change our cycle's operating conditions uh, to different ambient temperatures, um, we don't always know that the subcooling is going to be the this, this same value. So one possible approach to do this, and, and it still may be meaningful, is just leave subcooling as your uh, convergence criteria. 
But one other way to do this is to set the charge, because we know that the refrigerant charge isn't going to change. So I ran the simulation once, and I found that the refrigerant charge was uh, 1.377 kilograms. I know that that charge isn't going to change. And I'm going to set that as my uh, convergence criteria, so that when I run the cycle at different ambient temperatures for the SEER calculation, I'm always going to have the same charge, but the subcooling may change. I don't know what the subcooling is going to be. Um, and the superheat is going to be controlled by the expansion device, so we know that will be the same. So under solver settings, I want to go from taking just a simple, single simulation, and I want to calculate SEER instead now. So I'm going to select Calculate SEER at the bottom here. I'm going to put in just the default value for the cyclic degradation coefficient, because I don't know what it is. And then here's my list of cities. I can, I can choose from any of these cities that have been added in. And this should cover um, you know, all of the important climate regions of, of the US. And um, we can set up a number of parallel runs if we want to, uh, to make that calculation even faster. And we'll just say OK and save this information. Actually, let me go ahead and solve it without this here, uh, just to show that we're going to get the same results when we use charge as our convergence criteria. So we have the same charge, and we're getting some kind of performance. So we've run it once, and now we're going to run the SEER calculation. So when we go to click Run, we're going to get this message saying that these uh, folders need to be initialized, or if it's the first time, it'll ask you to initialize them. Since I've done it before, it'll ask me if I want to reinitialize it. I'll just go ahead and show what it looks like to initialize it. You'll see it takes some time to get all the folders ready and, and get everything working. So in the background, basically what's happening here is uh, the simulation is being run multiple times. Rather than just once, um, we're getting the results for the, the different test points that, that go along with the uh, rating standard. And here are our results. Um, we have our SEER value now in, displayed here. Um, and the COP, the EER, everything for our components, like we would have in, in a normal run from VapePsych, this is based on whatever temperature you set in the interface. So if I had my uh, condensing temperature here as 35 degrees C, that's the result I'm, I'm getting um, in all of the system results. So if I look at my compressor, my, my heat exchangers, the, re the results that are displayed here are the results for the single cycle simulation you set up um, originally. But you also get this SEER calculation, um, which, is, which is coming from multiple simulations results. So um, you know, in the past, this would have required you to do a parametric study of, of different conditions in, in VapePsych and then do this long calculation of, of weighting out the, uh, the SEER value. Now that can all be automatically done. And hopefully, it saves a lot of time in, in uh, getting an understanding of how a, a system will perform. So that's everything I wanted to cover for the uh, demonstration. Um, if there are more questions about you know, specific problems, obviously we can we can take care of that on a tech support basis, and um, I'm free for uh, answering any of your emails that you might have questions or problems with. Um, but to conclude the session, I wanted to talk about a, a bunch of different items. If anyone has any feedback for these, um, let's um, you know let's discuss. I'll take notes on on your thoughts and. We can, we can kind of take your feedback into account as we continue to develop the tool and um, work with it and come up with solutions for our customers. So um, first of all, just uh, if anyone has any questions about the, the new features that, that have been presented today, um, you can go ahead and take those. Okay, great. Well, I'll take that as a no, and um, we can we can address any questions. Uh, um, so, uh, in the future, um, we're going to try to hold these webinars every uh, six months or so, um, and and these would be uh, as as updates and releases of Coil Center and and VapePsych are made. Uh, we'll try to have some webinars either describing the new release or describing different tasks. Um, one of the first ones I have in mind is is uh, a webinar specifically devoted to uh, simulating small diameter tube heat exchangers or microfin heat exchangers, um, because this is a new capability we're adding into the feature in, into the into the program. Um, 
it's a new feature. Um, we'll, you know, we want to go over the uh, the correlations that have been added and, and kind of the the methodology for, for designing one of these heat exchangers. So that's one of the, the future suggested webinars. Um, but there are obviously a lot of other topics that would be interesting. So um, if anyone has any feedback on uh, webinars to to, to uh, carry out in the future, we'd be open to doing that. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, so uh, let me jump to this last one um, quickly. Um, we are intending to end support for Windows XP. Um, it's a much older operating system, and uh, continuing to support it is uh, you know, a time-consuming effort that doesn't seem to benefit any of our users. So um, this is just kind of a, a notification or um, a question if this would be acceptable to your organization. Um, if anyone is still using Windows XP, let us know. Um, we can we can continue that support, but um, our impression is that uh, it's not being used. Um, so again, if you, you're using Windows XP or you know someone who is using XP with Cloud Center Vape Psych, let us know. Um, otherwise, uh, in the future, that that support may be ended. And then just uh, as far as general thoughts, um, certainly would appreciate any feedback anyone has in terms of um, you know, what kind of barriers inhibit, inhibit your productivity when you use Coil Designer and Vape Psych. What is a bottleneck in, in your design process? Um, and, and what kind of new features would you like to see? You know, we're all ears to this. So if, if you have any suggestions or um, comments, you know, please let us know. Um, we can talk about that right now, or, or you can send, a, send an email in. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot for your time. Um, take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you.